Vous pensiez que CGM, ce n'était qu'une émission sur l'image de synthèse Que toutes les infos étaient repiquées sur Wikipédia Que les réponses des intervenants étaient inventées de toutes pièces Que l'anglais était traduit par Google Trad <rire> Bande de pignouf Bienvenue dans les interviews CGM, des entretiens privilégiés qui retracent pour vous l'épopée des pionniers de l'image de synthèse au cinéma. Depuis le début de CGM, j'ai eu l'occasion d'interviewer de nombreux pionniers de l'image de synthèse, mais nos échanges restaient bien souvent limités au format texte. Avec cette nouvelle émission, ce spin-off de CGM, c'est pour moi l'occasion de partager directement avec vous les anecdotes de ces premiers pionniers de l'imagerie numérique, leurs techniques, tips et autres souvenirs d'un temps aujourd'hui révolu. Le premier d'entre eux qui a bien voulu prendre du temps pour répondre à mes questions en vidéo, c'est DevSig. Ancien de la compagnie Omnibus, il a notamment eu l'opportunité de travailler sur deux films pour enfants des années 80, Explorers et Flight of the Navigator. Mais avant cela, il faisait partie d'une autre compagnie, Image West. Ma première question, Dave, sera donc de savoir comment vous avez fait pour rejoindre Image West. Well, thank you for asking me. I guess I really started at Image West in about 1980, and I had been the chief engineer at the University Media Center in Mississippi, and I was just kind of ready for the next big thing. And I saw an advertisement in the trade journal for a company in Hollywood that was looking for a chief engineer. They needed somebody that knew computers and that knew video. And at the time, there were very few people that knew both. So that's how I started working at Image West. Image West utilisait un système appelé le Scanimate qui permettait de faire de l'image de synthèse de façon analogique. Que pouvez-vous nous dire sur cet appareil et quelles étaient les différences et les avantages par rapport au numérique Image West had two Scanimates. Uh, this is actually not one of them, but it's one of the only two remaining Scanimates in the world that I'm aware of. I have both of them. It's an analog computer. The advantage of an analog computer is that it can do animation in real time. Now your animator becomes an electronic engineer and uses these patch cords and all of those knobs to literally program a circuit that builds an animation that moves from keyframe to keyframe. It's a very different experience. Even with today's modern digital computers, they don't move quite fast enough. When you turn a knob, you kind of have to wait a little bit to see the response. With the Scanimate, it's instantaneous. And then when you push the sequence button to go from the beginning to the end of your animation, the whole thing happens in real time. And so you end up putting a lot of layers on the videotape Certains films, comme Logan's Run, Star Wars épisode 4 ou encore Final Yamato, utilisaient tous le Scanimate. Mais comme vous êtes arrivé à la toute fin 1979, quels sont les projets sur lesquels vous avez participé à ce moment-là Logan's Run et Star Wars were both done before I came to work there, but they were both done in a similar fashion. The Scanimate has a CRT on which the image appears, and that's photographed by another camera. In the old days, it was a video camera at NTSC resolution. Recently, we've done a lot of work with high definition where we shoot the CRT in high definition and it stands up really well. But uh, Logan's Run and Star Wars, both the scenes were shot with a film camera looking at the CRT. So we're kind of using some of the same techniques, but High definition, in my opinion, is a little better than film, so... En 1984, vous avez rejoint Omnibus. Pourquoi Omnibus et pas Digital Productions? Well, John Penny was president of Omnibus, and I already knew him, and he called me. So that was a pretty easy choice. Digital Productions at the time had gotten some money from Control Data. They were in the process of buying a Cray XMP. It was just a very different way of working. We were in the analog world, and most of their people kind of looked down their noses at analog because they were pure digital and could do anything. So it was a very, very interesting time in terms of CGI. Um, the analog had the advantage that it was fast, it was that particular look, still popular. Digital was painstakingly slow, required the fastest computers you could get, and still took forever to render, so it didn't really make a lot of sense. And frankly, when you look at things like the first Tron and some of the 
CGI movies that they made with those early computers that were on the order of five and six million instructions per second. It's amazing that that worked. À l'époque, vous étiez vice-président de la section recherche et développement et travaillez sur un ordinateur appelé le Super Funly F1, tout juste récupéré de triple I après la fin de Tron. Comment était-ce de travailler sur un tel monstre So Omnibus's business plan was to set up these three facilities and John Penny had made arrangements to buy the Funly F1 so-called supercomputer from Triple-I. Triple-I had built it, as I understand it, there was a government program to build a optical character recognition system, and they were going to try to make this machine do that. That contract fell through about the same time that John Whitney and Gary Demos approached them about using their system and their computer to do computer graphics. I have a picture of it, and you'll see most of the expanse of gray is the F1, at least on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is an even older computer that was called a KA-10, I believe it is. And that was the very first DEC PDP-10. It was a 36-bit machine, a six million instruction per second computer, which by today's standards is not even a, I guess, a 286. So it was a really, really slow machine. But at the time, the only other machine we had was PDP-11s, and we had a VAX, 11780, which was one MIP. So this machine was six times faster. It was complicated because we were still trying to figure out what all the F1 was, what it could do, how well it worked. There were a lot of directories and files and information that had been built up over years. And so you had to know whose directories to look in. It was kind of strange in a way. Anyway, Omnibus built a facility at Paramount Studios that had the F1, had a VAX 780 because we were also developing Unix-based software, which after the demise of Omnibus went on to become a company uh, or was bought by a company that became Houdini, uh, which is still in business today. Greg Hermanovic and uh, Kim Davidson, who were at Omnibus then in Toronto. Quels étaient vos rapports avec l'équipe en charge des images de synthèse sur Explorers L'expérience d'Ardwinski, directeur artistique sur le film et ancien de Triple I, vous a-t-elle aidé à mieux comprendre comment le Funly fonctionnait Art Dorinsky had worked at Triple I on Tron. He had digitized Peter Fonda's face. Uh, he had done Looker, where Cindy grows. <laughs> So Art had a lot of experience with the F1 and knew a lot of shortcuts and tricks and, and ways to get things out of that machine that the rest of us didn't know because we hadn't grown up with it. But we had a very a very good team of people. Art Dorinsky was in charge of all the creative people. Uh, Michiko Suzuki, Doug McMillan, Rick Balabuck. Jim Rapley had worked with the F1 before and he helped me with a lot of the maintenance on that machine. L'une des merveilles du Funly était sa capacité à imprimer des images sur film pellicule. Seulement, dans les années 80, les disques durs n'étaient pas encore assez gros et chaque image n'était gardée en mémoire que le temps de l'impression. Comment était-ce de travailler dans de telles conditions The F1 was a very strange computer. It had very limited disk space. The disk drives were the size of washing machines and only held, I think, 47 megabytes. And we had three of those. And so it was all we could really do at film resolution to store the red, green, blue images for two frames and so the computer would calculate the frame and it would send it to the PFR80 film recorder and it would begin printing that frame while the computer calculated the next frame and they took generally about the same amount of time. Uh, for explorers they wanted a big fly over this landscape and of course it was all simple vector graphics by today's standards it was trivial but back then All the Z sorting of the information and perspective took a lot of time. You got to remember the F1 was only about a 5 MIP machine and it had very limited memory. In fact, the movie machine memory was a combination frame buffer that doubled as I think it was 512K of 
36-bit words. Uh, so it could store a lot, but still, 512K, that was considered a lot of memory in those days. And the F1 itself, the main memory was only 256K. So by adding the 512K, you could dump a picture into that and see it on a monitor, which back in those days was even an amazing thing. And then in addition to that, it would use that memory when it was rendering. So you would actually, on the monitor for the MMM, you would see all these pixels jumping around as the rendering process took place. So it was kind of interesting to watch that. But the Tran new software that was on the F1 didn't have anti-aliasing. And so instead it calculated the picture at extremely high resolution. Of course, by today's standard, it's, it's not that high. It was like 4K by 6K, but that was a higher resolution than the film recorder could image. So essentially the film recorder became the anti-aliasing. If you were lucky, the amount of time it took to render a frame was about the same amount of time that it took to print a frame onto film. And that could vary between two or three minutes and an hour a frame. It didn't take that long to print at an hour a frame, but then you ran into other problems because the film recorder would drift that much in between frames. And I can remember going in to watch dailies. We would rent a projection room on the Paramount lot and we would just have a run that had run for two or three days and it would be maybe 12 seconds and so we would loop that the beginning back to the end and we'd get the projectionist to load that in the projector and it would just run and we could watch our 12 second scene over and over and i remember so vividly that even with the best projection and with the projectionist taking extreme care every cycle through that projector it degraded a little bit and by the time we'd watched for maybe 10 or 15 minutes it had all kinds of scratches and dirt and i remember thinking this is a terrible way to distribute content but that was film And that was the way it was done back then. Apparemment, à cause d'un technicien maladroit, vous aviez eu à subir une panne électrique durant la production des images de synthèse d'Explorers. Comment vous en êtes-vous sorti One of the electricians for Paramount was hot wiring something in a cabinet outside of the building and dropped his wrench across two of the power mains, which melted the wrench and blew up half the power supplies in the F1. So we thought we had. Plenty of time to produce the final, which was this long zoom and going through this circuit board. And it all had to be one continuous thing. It was like 40 seconds long, something like that. So back then that could take like two weeks of render time. And so this wrench got dropped right in the middle of that production run. And I can remember driving into work after snatching three or four hours of sleep I'd been up three or four days straight and seeing a big billboard on the Hollywood freeway that said, coming next week, Explorers. <laughs> and I remember thinking, well, <laughs> maybe if we're lucky. Parlons à présent de Flight of the Navigator. Dans ce film, pour la première fois, l'objet en image de synthèse reflétait l'environnement autour de lui de façon réaliste. Comment avez-vous fait en 1986 Bob Hoffman, who had been at Digital Effects in New York, Uh, had come to work for us and he had developed a reflection mapping scheme. One of the things that was required in Flight of the Navigator was they wanted this cloaking effect. He had this scheme where it moved the normals of the reflective object until it basically showed you the background. And um, when the ship was in front of a complicated background, it worked really well, it looked really cool. But every time the ship was supposed to go into this cloaking mode, it was in outer space. So the only thing that could be reflected were stars, which were just little pinpoints. So the cloaking effect didn't work too well in outer space, even though it was a cool effect. When the ship was on Earth, we basically composited a lot of scenes from actual photography on locations so that we could uh, build a spherical reflection map. That's the way that reflections worked before we really were able to do ray tracing, is that you had a spherical reflection map, and so the rays were calculated as they bounced off the object from the camera to lights or other things in the environment. The ship itself was created as a plaster cast, and then that was sawed with a bandsaw, and then we took those cross sections and digitized those on a tablet, and then skinned all that together and did some spline 
smoothing. I believe uh, Doug McMillan, and uh, we had a French guy named Patrick DeWarren, I believe, that worked on those. But we definitely ran out of computer power. I know at one point we even worked a little bit with the San Diego Supercomputer Center where they had a cray and uh, did some rendering there. Changeons de sujet. En 1987 est arrivé un événement dans votre carrière, un événement connu sous le nom de DOA ou Dead on Arrival. Pouvez-vous nous en parler de votre perspective So at any rate, uh, Omnibus was a Canadian company, had New York, Toronto and the Hollywood facility at Paramount Studios. And um, along the way, they decided to, I think they got news that digital productions and Able were about to fold. You know, even in the modern day, you look at Rhythm and Hughes, it's, it's a very difficult business and a very difficult business model. And it was even more difficult back then. So the thought was, if we had all the creative people they have at Able, and if we had the Cray Super computer and the digital film printer and all the software we developed at Omnibus that all of that would just meld together and be this big huge wonderful biggest thing on the planet and unfortunately you had three different design groups you had three different sales groups you had three different technical groups three different sets of software and it was just like mixing oil and water it didn't ever really work and that was the sad demise that became DOA. Que s'est-il passé pour vous après le DOA Dans quel état d'esprit étiez-vous après avoir passé autant d'années dans cette industrie alors naissante When Omnibus went under, it really was difficult for me. I had just had my first daughter who at the time was I think 12 months old, about a year old. It was difficult for me. I stayed home and uh, my wife went to work. She had worked for PBS station. And I know a lot of people had a lot of difficult times as a result of Omnibus going under. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you and uh, I look forward to our next interview. Merci infiniment, Dave. Thank you. Voilà, c'était le premier numéro de CGM Interviews. J'espère que vous avez apprécié cet entretien autant que j'ai eu le plaisir de le préparer. N'hésitez pas à partager la vidéo autour de vous et surtout à me laisser vos commentaires. Moi, je vous donne rendez-vous pour l'épisode 11 de CGM sur Explorers et Young Sherlock Holmes. Et en attendant, n'oubliez pas que vous pouvez suivre et soutenir CGM sur Tipeee, Twitter, Facebook, mais aussi mon site, gorkamnitrix.com. Oh, et comme dirait Wolfgang et Ben dans Explorers... C'est pretty neat, hein Oh, yeah